I want to share the next installment in our Rise Eagles Nest series. I know um, most of you will have been tracking with me, um, whether or not online or during uh, the last few weeks. But just to recap, just to bring everyone up to speed, um, we are in the midst of an Arise season, and um, the word I heard the Lord speak over new life uh, coming into the fall and looking ahead for next year was the word arise. And there was this sense in which um, there were promises, there were uh, calls, there were dreams um, and prayers even that we had prayed individually but also as a community that actually were sown in a previous season that God was going to cause to actually arise in this next season. Some of the things that we prayed for we will realize in a future series. Uh, so, series, future season. Um, and I believe uh, for many of us, this is a key season that we're heading into. And God is inviting us to partner in faith for that which he is causing us to arise. And so we've been inviting you into asking and dialoguing with God. What is it that you're rising over? What promises are you um, specifically going to cause to come to happen in this season because God wants you to attach faith to the things that he's working in and around your life. Um, and as a church, one of the things I've been sensing that God has been rising over is this prophetic eagle's nest call that was released to New Life in 2003 uh, by uh, pro the, the prophet Bob Jones when he came here and shared for 10 years he'd been carrying a word on his heart that three regions in North America were eagle's nests. And by eagle's nests, uh, I believe that he meant that they were uh, literally environments that would, would cause this multi-generational um, um, continuation legacy of specific things that God was birthing in each of these regions. And Reading was one of those, and Reading was a governmental uh, region um, a, uh, in terms of the kingdom, and uh, Albany being another one, and that was supernatural signs and wonders. And Kelowna was a, a prophetic eagle's nest. Um, and the word was released to new life, but it was spoken over the city. And I believe that the, the the stewardship in part of this word is something that God has actually released to new life. Um, and so in this season of Arise, um, my team and I have been sensing that the, this is one of the things that God wants us to, to focus in on and steward. And so we've been unpacking what does it mean to be an eagle's nest in this season. And um, we've been looking at some of the key foundations of what it is to be a prophetic community. Um, and by the way, that's not exclusive to eagle's nests or new life. It was a call to the entire body of Christ that was released and birthed um, actually on the day of Pentecost when Peter announced to uh, the people that were observing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He referenced a prophecy that the prophet Joel had said uh, in which God had said in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And, and, and what we miss in this is that the prophetic was something in the Old Testament that was exclusive to um, key agents of God, the prophets of God. And they were an exclusive band of people but in the New Testament, when God poured out his spirit on the people of God on the day of Pentecost, that remit of being a prophet got, uh, got released to the entire body of Christ. And, and so in effect, every single church is meant to be a prophetic community. Now, when I say that, I'm conscious that most of us have in our heads this picture of what that means. But I believe it's actually much broader than just simply thus saith the Lord's statements. Whoops. I figured that might happen. Um, it's bigger than the, the just prophesying. It is to represent Christ to the world. That's, that was the task of prophets in the Old Testament. Prophets actually represented God to the people of God and to the world around them. 
And so to be a prophetic community, a New Testament prophetic community, is to be Jesus to the world. It's to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. It's to do the things that Sandra was talking about that our missions projects do where they, they minister to the marginalized. They, they um, protect and bring intervention into people's lives in a way that pulls them out of the most horrible situations of poverty and, and sex slavery and all those kinds of things. That's a prophetic community in action, in part. So it, to be a prophetic community is much broader than just simply prophesying, although it is that as well. Um, and so we're leaning in in this season to unpack everything that God has in his heart around this. And we, we're exploring together um, around this. And over the last few weeks, I've been laying some, some foundation stones, some, some ABCs, the one, two, threes of um, hearing God's voice. And last week, we began to talk, or I began to talk about some of the different channels through which God speaks to people on um, to grow our capacity to get better as a community in our own lives and as a community of hearing when God's talking to us. Because very often when God is speaking, many of us miss him because we're listening on different channels to what he is speaking on. And, and so last week we opened our aperture to some of the different ways or, or some other ways that you may not be familiar with that God broadcasts his voice on. And we need to grow individually and as a community in that. Um, today I want to uh, talk about D coding what we hear God saying. Um, and before I jump into that, I want to pray because I, I, I've had this sense in which as opposed to just giving you information or just teaching, there is something about the heart of God in this message that he wants you to capture. Um, and I need God's help in conveying that. Um, and normally when I ask us to pray, um, before a message or before I start speaking, I'm, in, I'm praying for you that you would have hearts to hear and ears to hear. And all of that is true. But I'm wondering if you would pray for me right now that I would be able to convey to you that which is on God's heart. Yeah? I wonder if you can do that. I know it sounds weird. Maybe you want to stretch your hands out. Yeah. And if you're listening online, you can do that as well. God, that is my prayer today, that huh, I'd accurately, I'd accurately capture your heart. Lord, I don't want to simply transmit information, head knowledge. Lord, I, I pray that that which I bring, the, the word of God for today, would convey your heart. I pray that, God. Give me a grace to do that, anointing to do that. And I pray on the other side of this, for us as a community, new life, the things that you need us to hear out of that which you've given me to share, give us a grace to be able to actually hear and receive the things that you have for us. Yeah, Lord, I pray that this community, more and more, each day, week by week, would look more like Jesus. Amen. Amen, Amen. wow. All right, as I said, I wanna talk about decoding God. And what I mean by that is that how many of you have heard God speak but have actually not understood what he's speaking to you. Does that, yeah, numbers of you, you know exactly what I'm, uh, I'm talking about. Um, and if you're in that camp, you're not alone. Um, even our heroes of faith in the Bible found themselves in those 
uh, in that position. Um, even some prophets, many prophets, when they heard God speak, didn't have a clue what God was speaking to them. Um, I'm doing a, a year of reading my Bible daily. I've got this plan that keeps me on track reading through my Bible. I'm a, a creature of habit unless I have a plan in place. I tend to be um, so relaxed about my Bible reading that more often than not, it doesn't happen. And so I have this this app, a Bible reading app, that, um, that leads me through reading the Bible uh, in its entirety in a year. Um, and it's not from Genesis to Revelation. They split the books up into different portions. And right now, um, my Bible reading is in Daniel. Um, and the prophet Daniel was a famous prophetic person. Um, and he was one of the most prophetic people in Israel's history. He, he's legendary as a prophet. Um, he was able, it was said in the Bible, to interpret dreams. And he was so prophetic that he could even um, know the dreams that God had given other people. Uh, on one occasion, um, the ruler of Babylon has this worrying dream that he's confused about. And he goes to all of his wise men and he says to them, um, I want you to interpret my dream. And the, the wise people say to the king, um, yes, we'll do that for you. Uh, but the king says, no, um, I don't just want you to interpret my dream. I want you to tell me the dream that I had and then interpret it. And Daniel, uh, no one can do this apart from Daniel. And, and the king notes that he is apart from all the other uh, interpreters of dreams in his day. There's something special on this man. And yet the Bible tells us on a number of occasions in Daniel's experience where he has these remarkable encounters, prophetic encounters with the Lord, he hasn't got a clue as to what the Lord is saying. Um, and uh, on one of those occasions in Daniel 7, he, he dreams of, um, uh, sorry, he has this dream of four different beasts. And, and Daniel reflects after the dream because he's, he's wrestling to understand what it says. He says, I was troubled in spirit and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all of this. And then in Daniel 12, verse 8, he sees the, the, a dream depicting the, the future events of the world. And Daniel remarks, I heard but didn't understand. And so Daniel, like us, um, was hearing God well but not necessarily understanding what God was saying. And he needed to decode what he heard from the Lord. Um, and fast forward into the time of Jesus and you look at the word of God being amongst the people of God and Jesus is there speaking to his disciples about all sorts of things. And on numerous occasions in the gospels you read how the disciples stood there baffled by what Jesus said or did. They were like, huh? I haven't got a clue as to what's going on and what he's saying. Um, and, um, and so we see this um, in the life of Jesus. We see this in Jesus' parents as to uh, when he is growing up in the um, story of Jesus going to the temple uh, age 12, he gets left behind or he stays behind in Jerusalem. Joseph and Mary head back home to where they live and a day into their journey they touch base with one another thinking that Jesus is in their midst and they figure out Jesus is not with either of them and so they go back to Jerusalem looking for him and they find him after three days in the temple and they're totally bombazzled um, by uh, why he's doing this and Jesus says I have to be about my father's business they were confused as to what the word of God was doing in their midst and then I mentioned this during communion that Jesus had this huge growing church amongst him and one day he stands up and he breaks some bread and, and holds up some wine and he says, oh no, he doesn't, he, he doesn't do that there. He says though, um, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he loses his entire church because he offends their minds. They haven't got a clue as what he's saying. But it was the word of God being spoken amongst them. And then... Um, 
the Pharisees, who knew the word of God more than any other people group uh, of their day. And, and they're praying actively for the Messiah, and yet when he turns up, they don't recognize him in their midst. They were, uh, even though they had the revelation of God in their midst, they still missed God was speaking to them. So if you have ever heard God speak to you or feel that God is leading you to do something and you haven't fully understood stuff or got it wrong along the way, you're in good company. Um, but we can get better at decoding God. Um, and I want to talk to you about some things that go into what is very often an unconscious process that takes place in the decoding of the things that we're hearing God speak to us. Um, Chris Vallotton talks about how the prophetic process in our lives has three different steps. One is the revelation piece, and that was what I was talking about last week in terms of the languages of God. And then there is the interpretation uh, process, which is the decoding what we hear. And then there is the application of what we believe God has said to us. Um, and I would want to propose to you that the most important aspect, they're all important, each of those three steps, but the most important aspect or the thing that most of us has to grow most in is the second stage of the process. I think it's the most important because the danger of not hearing God well can lead to problems in our own lives, but also if we have words for other people, they can actually cause damage to the people that we're speaking to. So it's important that, as Sean Bolt says, we translate God correctly, where we, whereby we capture in what we're hearing God speak or how he's telling us to live in ways that truly represent the heart and character of God. I'll give you an example of this. Um, I shared last week about something of my call to becoming a, um, a, a full-time Christian leader where God spoke to me, uh, the internal audible voice of God in a worship service where I heard God during worship saying, I, I am calling you to be a shepherd. Um, and I'm calling you to full-time Christian ministry, and you will require a period of preparation and training which re requires both a formal element but also a family component. Um, and that happened in 1999, and in 2001, I really was feeling a stirring, and Jody and I were feeling a stirring in our spirit that the time had come to engage in the formal component of our um, our training as ministers of the gospel. Um, and um, we felt like God was confirming this to us. And because we were called, or I was called in the UK um, and received this, this call to be a shepherd in the UK, we believed that God wanted us to do our ministry in the UK. But we were living in New Zealand at the time. And we were so convinced that this was what God wanted for us that we set, up our, um, we set about being obedient to this word that we believe God was speaking to us. And so um, being bold and obedient believers, we put our house on the market, um, I quit my job, we booked air tickets, and we stepped out in faith to obey the Lord. Um, and um, what was amazing was that at the time uh, in New Zealand, New Zealand was actually going through this incredible house, uh, housing um, boom. Um, and houses were in huge demand, similar to what's happened in Kelowna over the last few years, but on steroids. Houses weren't just taking a month to sell, which during the boom here in Kelowna they had been. They were taking literally days and weeks and so when the, the real estate person came to us, we were in this ideal location. We had this beautiful um, colonial house, which was very desirable in New Zealand. And the real estate agent said, no problem, Maddie and Jody, this house will be sold in days. And so we listed our house um, and um, the, the, the first seven days turned into a week. And we were like, okay, it might take a week, but then, the first week turned into two weeks, and then three weeks, and nothing was happening. 
And so we were convinced that there was spiritual opposition to this word that we were thinking that God had spoken to us about where it was that God wanted us to do our training. And so we enlisted friends to pray against the demonic strategy to stop us fulfilling the word of God on our lives, to go back to the UK and train. Um, And we recruited some close friends with us. And I started to pray and I started to fast and I started to rebuke the devil. But still our house wouldn't sell. Um, And I was thinking how strong and mighty the devil was in resisting the prayers of the people of God. And about two weeks into specifically praying about um, the devil getting out of the way and our house selling, a friend of mine came to me and said, I've been sensing, Maddie, that um, you're not meant to go back to the UK and I really feel like you're meant to stay here. And he gave me the passage out of Acts uh, about the Macedonian call where Paul tried to go to certain locations to preach the gospel and the doors closed to him every time and suddenly uh, there appeared in his dream a Macedonian man saying, come here and he went there and the doors opened and he preached the gospel. And it was like the penny dropped in that moment. I had this horrible realization that I'd been rebuking God, not the devil, in my dreams. I got it so wrong in trying to follow God. What went wrong? Well, my decoding of trying to follow the voice of God went wrong in my life at the time. Um, And... I've since then learned some checks and balances about how to get better at decoding what God is saying. And by the way, I need to preference that with occasionally still I get it wrong. All right. So here's some things that we need to grow in. Number one, our Bible knowledge. In our decoding of the things God speaks to us for our own lives or for other people, they have to fit within the revelation of God in the Bible. And I've mentioned already that um, the people in Jesus' day were supposedly the most word knowledgeable people on the planet, and yet when the Messiah came their way, they completely missed him, and worse, they killed him. And, And so there is truth that Bible knowledge helps But at the same time, our knowing of the Bible has to be a specific kind of a knowing um, in terms of it helping us translate and decode the things of God. And what I mean by that is that our Bible reading has to translate into something um, the Hebrew language calls yada which is a knowing of God that is more than a head knowledge. It's an intimacy knowledge of God. We need to know God. Um, It was said of Moses in Psalm 103 that God made known his ways to Moses. God made yada his ways to Moses and his deeds to the people of God. And I believe that this distinguished, this yada knowledge, Y-A-D-A, of God that Moses had, actually qualified him for leadership within the people of God. The yada knowledge that Moses has about God and his heart caused him to be a a leader that God could invest in and use to lead the people of God. It's why when... um, Israel sinned that Moses instead of saying let's wipe the slates clean and start again which is what God offered Moses reflected back to God and said no God no God let's go on from here have mercy on them show them grace show them patience Um, and I've shared before how very often when I read those verses it would appear that Moses was more merciful than God in these instances but that's not true because God is God and he's perfect actually what was going on here is that Moses was able to reflect God's deepest heartbeat 
And beyond the legitimate need for justice in these instances, Moses was able to go to places in God's heart that hadn't yet been revealed, that would be later revealed in the person of Jesus, that God desired mercy, not sacrifice. How did he get that? He knew the true heartbeat of God in circumstances. Um, and the word yada appears in Genesis 4 verse 1 where um, it was said that Adam knew he yarded his wife Eve and she conceived. There is this level of intimacy in knowing the heartbeat of God that actually we need to acquire so that when that is absorbed into our DNA, that the things of God we hear percolate through our knowing about the heart of God and we're able to decode what God is saying in, um, through the words that come to us. Um, a number of years ago, um, I was ministering with a team of people in Colombia and um, we, we, we were praying for um, the sick on the streets before this crusade and we were seeing incredible miracles happen all over the place and we, we were having so much fun with it that we decided to head to where we thought the most people would be which was the, the, the local market square and we got to the local market square and it was empty except for um, about 10 youths that were sitting on the steps and I walked up to them and I said hello through my translator um, is there anything we can pray for you about and immediately I felt these daggers uh, through their eyes pointing at me and I was later told that we'd interrupt them taking drugs. They were doing hard drugs in the city square and my translator said he felt afraid for his life um, at the time. But innocently, I, I knew none of this and I was like, hello, foreigner, want to pray for you, want to talk to you about Jesus. Um, but I felt the resistance in the spirit. And immediately, as I'm feeling this, one of the kids is highlighted to me, and he's wearing a cap, he's got his head down, and I hear the Lord speak to me. He, um, he has issues, I suspected they were drugs, um, and he's been booted out of home. And, um, and I felt the Lord say, tell him I want him to be my child. And it struck me that there was this process that's later kind of analyzing what I heard through what I know of this prophetic process. I realized that I, had I not known God's heart for mercy and redemption, that there was a danger in which this word, if I'd had a different picture of God, could have been twisted and morphed into something that didn't represent God's heart to this kid. If I'd understood God as this angry God who, um, who didn't stand for sin, who didn't stand for rebellion against parents, I could have easily twisted or it could have e the, the word could have easily corrupted in my listening process and arrived in my soul as God sees the sin of this kid's life and he's angry with him and unless he repents, the father won't accept him. And we hear those very things come out of the mouths of many of the people of God towards the sin in the world that they see. And I, I, wanna, I wanna propose to you today that that isn't a true capturing of the heart of God. I did, and, and when we do that and we present the angry, righteous God to the world, we're not presenting Jesus to them. In this particular story, I shared with this kid, I, through my translator, I said, I believe, I actually shared what I heard. I believe that you've had trouble at home, that you've been booted out of home, that your father has said he doesn't want you, but the father wants you to know that he wants you to be his son. Will you receive him? It was the simplest gospel message I've ever given in my life. And this kid whose head was bowed made eye contact with me, and he said, yes. And the team went over to him and prayed. His name was Jesus. And he wept on the steps as the father whose heart was wide open to him embraced him. 
And he shared his story that because of his struggle with drugs, his father had been so angry and booted him out of home and he'd been living on the streets for the last few days. And here in an instant, the, the father of all fathers turns to him and says, you're not done yet. There's hope in your life. I want you to be my child. And he comes running into the heart of the father whose arms awoke wide open. And I've always been humbled by that story, but I've been horrified by the possibility that had me or the church not represented God properly to this kid, it would have been a disaster story, not a redemption story. Our hearing of God has to represent Jesus. And so number two, what helps us decode God? Theology helps us to decode God. And when you hear that word, most of you think of formal study of the Bible. But um, theology in essence is the study of the person of God. We need to yada, we need to get to this place where we are able to accurately apprehend who God is. I once had a, a, a lady come down the front uh, for prayer and I, I don't mind praying for people, but I want, them, I want to grow people's capacity to be able to receive from God themselves. And very often in that, they have to be able to hear God um, themselves. And, and so often, instead of praying for someone, I will lead them into this place where they're able to apprehend in prayer the things they're coming to me to pray for them on their behalf. It seems like that's, that would be a good thing for a pastor to do. And in that process of helping or coaching a person to be able to receive from God, I, I often try and determine a person's capacity to be able to hear from God. And I lead them through this listening prayer as a way of me determining where they're at in their ability to hear God. And so I get them to ask this simple question, God, what is it that you love about me? And it will either show me that they can't hear God or they're not hearing God. And in this instance, this lady who came forward from, for prayer, I said, tell me what you hear God saying to you. And she immediately spurts back, God said to me, I'm worthless. And she was convinced that this was the voice of God speaking to her. And again, unless I knew the heartbeat of God, I could have easily assumed because she asked God to speak to her that she'd heard God right. But it didn't line up with my theology of the person of God. That wasn't the heartbeat of a loving God speaking to their child. And so I was able to discern for her that that wasn't the voice of God. And so I shared with her, you heard but that was not God. That was either you or a spirit speaking to you. Let's figure out which. And actually, we, we did some processing together and we realized that there was a ton of pain and rejection in her life. And it twisted God's voice into her life in that the only thing that she ever heard speaking to her was the voice of her angry father condemning her. And so when she would reach out to the father of all fathers, it would translate into her life as an angry voice. And so we dealt with that and she got healing and she asked for repentance for partnering with the lie. And then we tried the process again. And she stood there and she said, God, what is it that you love about me? And I can't remember the specifics of what he said, but it was life-giving words this time that she heard. You're beautiful, you're worthy, you're worthwhile. But what it was that she heard touched her so deeply, she melted into a flood of tears. We need our theology to line up with the voice of God. And I want to touch on this a bit. Do I want to touch on this? All right. <laughs> There's aspects of and branches of theology that we need to get right because where they do not line up with the Bible, they create a Frankenstein version of God to us. And I've talked about the loving aspect of God, but I'm just going to throw this out because this is going to stir you up <laughs> and you're going to wrestle with this all week. Um, there's a branch of theology that is predominant in um, 
uh, sorry, there's a branch of eschatology that is predominant in North America. And we think, we North Americans think, it's the only version of understanding what is to happen on this planet. It's called futurism. There's different other names to it. But in essence, it's the belief of the things in the Bible pertaining the, the end of the world are mostly still to happen. The, the books of the Bible, such as Daniel and even Ezekiel, uh, and in particular Revelation, Thessalonians, Matthew 24, that the verses um, in there that speak of things to come, people that embrace a futurist lens actually believe that they're still to play out in our day. But this viewpoint of theology most people don't realize it's only 200 years old. It was actually birthed out of um, the work that Schofield, who wrote the Schofield Bible, did. Um, he wrote a commentary on the Bible, which at the time it was written was rejected by the majority of uh, Christians and leaders of his day, but was later picked up when the Schofield Bible, which is an okay translation, became popular. And so people assumed that Schofield's interpretation of future events was um, accurate. And out of that embracement of his version and interpretation of how things will play out at the end were birthed um, the uh, um, Left Behind series that most North American evangelical Christians were schooled on um, as another book of the Bible um, and the book that explains how the end will play out. Why am I sharing this in relation to hearing God speak to us? Because our theological lenses that we have will distort or shape or influence how we perceive God speaking today about all sorts of things. Those with a futurist theology believe that most of the events described in Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation are still to happen. They're looking for the mark of the beast to happen. How many of you have wondered if this injection, of the, the various in injections could be the mark of the beast? Be honest. Yeah, some of you, except the, when you look into the historicity of this word, the beast in um, the day that John wrote um, Revelation was the nickname for Emperor Nero. Um, Emperor Nero was called the beast by um, Jews. It's, it's even in literature of, it, uh, of the day. And the mark of the beast was something that was historical that took place in cities across the Roman Empire, where in the local markets where you bought and sold goods, you had to worship the emperor. You had to give a sacrifice to the, end, uh, uh, to the emperor before you bought and sold goods. Um, and so you would go to the priest that stood by the altar at the gateway of the markets and you would have to offer a sacrifice to Nero, bow down to him. And once you did that, they would put an ink stain or some kind of mark on your head as a sign that you had actually worshipped the beast in Jewish minds. And the question Paul had to his original audience was, are you going to take the mark of the beast? Why am I sharing this? Depending on your lens that you have around eschatological events, future events, and how they play out in the Bible, is going to influence how you perceive things playing out in the world today. If you believe that mostly they've already happened, you're not going to interpret current events through that lens. But if you think they're still to happen, then you're going to be believing that they, the, the beast is going to be showing up left, right, and center. And by the way, there have been so many false prophecies about who the beast is along the way. I think there have been all sorts of beasts in my lifetime that the church has identified. All of them wrong. Because it, it's already happened. Why is this important? Because... When we see and hear through this lens, our prophetic 
Decoding gets skewy in our minds. What's going on? Our theology, in my opinion, in many places, is out of whack. All right. And by the way, um, I'm aware there's probably, that there are actually four different lenses to understanding how the events of the world will play out. Um, and I've been clear with this church um, that I'm not a futurist. I'm what the Bible calls, or not theologians call, a partial preterist. Uh, preterism means already happened. Partial means um, it's largely already happened. I believe in the second coming of Christ, but I l- believe predominantly the Matthew 24 passages, the R- book of Revelation, was talking about events that were historical in its day, in particular pertaining 70 AD. That's my belief. And by the way, I believe I'm on good ground because this was the belief of all the early church fathers. Um, and Many of our heroes of old, the Spurgeons, the John Wesleys, um, and uh, Jonathan Edwards, they were all partial preterists. So I'm in good company. Um, And Gary Best, um, who uh, used to be the uh, leader of um, the vineyard movement here in Canada, and I'm nearly done, by the way, um, had this great thing to say about this. Let me find it. Yeah, the only question about theology is whether uh, our theology is good or bad. 2,000 years of church history have given us some proven parameters for good theology. Scripture, faith, tradition, and sound reason. Thinking theologically is dynamic, a dynamic process like the development of an artist. One only becomes a great artist through much practice of the art within a community of masters. Um, and so, what am I trying to say here? I want you to be open to where God wants to reshape your theology, not to adopt a new thinking. I am suspicious of new theological thinking. I think one of the safeguards of the Christian faith is something called orthodoxy. Um, And I'll give you an example of why this is so important. Right Right now in our day, many of the church are reinterpreting the viewpoints around sexuality, gender, and marriage. And, we, and they're believing that actually if you extrapolate out what was said in the Bible, you will arrive at different perspectives to the historicity of what the early church fathers and indeed um, the, the Jews believed around uh, gender, sexuality, and marriage. Um, They say that the viewpoints around sexuality, gender, and marriage are more reflective of the heart, the love of Jesus. But Jesus didn't just say to the woman caught in adultery, um, you are forgiven. He also said, go sin no more. And so truth is always held hand in hand with love. Always. And so we need both. And so our theological moorings that have come out of years of church history are like precious stones that we need to guard and defend and protect. And and they are sacred stones that ensure that we do not mishear or misrepresent God to the world. Does this make sense? Good. There's so much more I want to go after, but I'm going to land the plane here. I feel like I've stirred some people up. Actually, I'll do a part two to this because there's some safeguards that we need to understand around when a word comes to us. We need to do some risk evaluation with whatever it is that God speaks to us and I'll talk about that the next time I share on this and I'll unpack some more around how theology is so important because there's some things that unbeknownst to us in our um, filter of the things we hear from God reflect more of our culture 
than the true essence of the heartbeat of God. And if our hearing is to translate into activity through our lives, then we need to make sure our filter is clean. Can I get you to stand? I'm going to pray this. Let me explain this first, and then I'm going to explain it, because this is a complete abuse of a verse in the Bible, but it will make sense to you when I've explained it. Um, It talks in the Bible about how before you address the sin of another person, go deal with the plank in your own eye. And really what that is talking about is um, making sure that your filter is clean. It doesn't say that you can't go talk to someone about issues in your own life, but it's saying actually do work on yourself beforehand. I believe that that applies to being a prophetic community. Our filters need cleaning. What if, regardless of how many years you've been a Christian, how far you've gone with God, um, your prophetic history, even how revelatory you are, that there's still areas of of your filter that God wants to touch in this season. My question to you is, are you open to the Spirit of God doing some tweaking if need be? If that is the case, then you pray a prayer along the lines of God. I give you permission to grow my capacity to decode your voice. I give you permission to search me, try me, to show me both the things in my life, my heart, that are out of sync in you, that cause a misinterpretation, a miscapturing of what truly you are speaking to me and through me or through our church to this world. Clean clean my lens. Wow. You can pray this as well if you're brave enough. I give you permission that any of my long-held theology that I've got that hasn't captured you properly, I give you permission in this season to change, shift, and align with something that more is Jesus. Bill Johnson says, by the way, Um, Jesus is perfect theology. Yeah, what else, God? Lord, I pray for this body of believers. I pray for this church that you would grow us increasingly in our capacity to hear. Help us to be more mature uh, better fitted, better able to, to hear and interpret you to the world. And I pray this, that Jesus would be increasingly seen through us. For your glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, I'm going to pray number six prayer over you. And then afterwards, if anyone wants prayer for anything specific, can I ask for um, some of the revival group leaders and elders that are here to be down the front to pray with people? And we do still need to be masked uh, up until we exit the building. I know for some of you find it challenging and problematic, but we've chosen as a church to uh, uh, um, adhere to the... Um, to what the government is saying around this. Um, Anyway, let me pray this. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his glorious, bright, shining face shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you. Oh, and the Lord give you peace. Now and always.